Tom Campbell here. If you find something of significant value in our videos, please consider supporting their production through our Patreon account or through a one-time donation. The links are in the description below. Thank you and enjoy the video. Well, welcome everyone to the 79th Fireside Chat. That means over 240 hours in this long running series with thanks to Oliver and to Justin who does the editing. Oliver runs the server and if you'd like to show your thanks to Oliver, please click on the Matrix Vison website below and figure out how to donate there. And Justin is our resident artist and editor and he also has a website we also have a new mbt searchable tool where you can search any subject you want within these fireside chats or any of the videos on tom's youtube channel according to the subject you'd like to to search on and of course the links will be in the description below let's get started with our first question and that's going to be carolyn go ahead so um, today, like, there might be a little bit of a right brain question, but yeah, like I have been doing a lot of um, yeah, like a lot of fear work. I've been doing a lot of self inquiry lately, and um, I feel like um, yeah, and since since then, like I kind of feel like I'm like a walking inner conflict. Um, if that makes sense, it's like I'm sometimes even thinking that like I'm insane, you know, because I don't really know what to believe in anymore. It's like everything I say and everything I think is just so, yeah, it's just so questionable. It's like, it just doesn't make sense, especially if I'm getting like in a conflict uh, and I'm sort of getting to also know the other person's perspective. I'm really like just thinking, yeah, that I'm, <laughs> <laughs> that I'm really insane and it's like a little bit confusing because it's in a way it's also it, it's really good because I I do get to see where my uh, beliefs and fears are but on the other hand it's also just so confusing to the point that like I don't really know what to say think or believe in anymore well Caroline uh, before you find peace and before you find tranquility, it's very likely that you'll go through a period of turmoil and a period of confusion. When you, when you are running your life through ego and through fear, everything can seem very solid. It's like you've been doing this your whole life. You know, you've been running your life through ego and fear for as long as you can remember. So it seems very, what can we say, stable, ordinary, uh, solid, because you've been doing it so long. And then you start making that transition to where you start questioning. You start realizing, you start seeing yourself um, being negative. You see yourself jumping to negative conclusions. You see yourself getting upset, getting angry, and you realize that it's mostly all about you and your feelings and your wants and your needs and your desires and the way you think life should be. And then you start to question that. And as you start to question that, you're going to feel confused, untethered, like, uh, you know, a ship with no rudder, no oars. You know, you're just kind of drifting and don't know what, what to do. I think that's pretty normal making the transition. So look at the looking at the positive side, it's a good sign in that it it's a sign of change. It's a sign that you have let go of a lot of the old ways of being, but you haven't yet grasped firmly the new ways of being. You're just somewhere in between, struggling to find those new ways of being and to finally let go of the old. So I think it's a pretty uh, positive thing, even that you get to this point that uh, you're learning so quickly 
that you notice the transition. Most people's learning and growing up takes place in very, very small steps over very, very long periods of time. And they don't really notice so much the change until they look back. When they look back and say, well, what was I like 10 years ago? Then they can see that there's been a big change, but they don't really notice it as they go. I think you've been in a situation recently where change is accelerated. You know, you're just, you're being challenged more. You're more introspective. You're looking at yourself. You're, you're, um, you're experimenting. So when change comes quickly and you're growing very fast, big steps rather than little steps, confusion and feeling unmoored, untethered, uh, you know, no, no rudder is pretty common. Just keep your focus on being positive, not being negative. Don't look for the what's wrong. Look for what's right. Focus on those things that would make you smile. If it doesn't make you fi- smile, then don't focus on that. Just let that be. It'll take care of itself. You don't necessarily have to go out and wrestle your demons to the ground. You just have to ignore them and they'll go away. You have to just let them go. You don't really have to fight with demons. You just have to let them go by focusing on the positive. So that would be my suggestion for you now. Just focus on the things that are good and the things that that hurt a bit and aren't so good. Just let them go and say, well, they're not so important. Let's just focus on what's good. What works? Focus on me making the best choices I can make for the best reasons, because it's the low entropy choice for not only me, but for everybody. Just kind of focus on that. Open, you know, open to to being changed, to becoming somebody else. And gee, I wonder who that's going to be. You know, who am I going to be when I finally grow up? You know, that sort of a thing. And be open and positive to that. Like, uh, you know, you're as curious as anybody else what you're going to be when you grow up. And uh, have a have a a positive attitude. Okay, I'm in flux now. I'm changing. So since I'm in flux and changing, I know I don't want to change for the worse. So let me just stay positive and not overthink things, not overprocess, because that will get you all wadded up as well, trying to use your intellect to solve the problems, trying to use your intellect to figure out, well, you know, what should I say and what should I do and should I be this way or that way or even how am I? Am I this way or am I that way? Oh, was that ego? If you keep working on it with your intellect, you'll just confuse yourself. Pretty soon you won't know who you are or what you're doing or why you're doing anything. You just kind of get all wadded up in a in a ball. Just be. Be who you are, but move toward those things that feel good. Move toward those things that seem like the right way to be, that are about other, that are positive, not the things that feel negative. And if you're not sure, then just be. Just keep on being and wait. Clarity will come with time. So transitions are difficult because they they leave you feeling unanchored. But you'll get through it. Just stay positive. Look on the bright side. Look for the silver lining in every dark cloud and appreciate that silver lining. And don't th- overthink things. Don't think too much. Am I doing this right? Am I doing that right? Because that's your intellect. Be better to feel it. Be better to feel it than think too much about it. Or if you do think about it, just think about it a little bit and then let it go. And if you're not getting anywhere, if you're chasing your tail, then quit thinking about it and think about it later. So those would be the things I would I would suggest.
Also be good at a time when you're in transition to pay attention to your dreams. What are your dreams telling you about yourself? Because that's getting down to the core of you. So just don't let that intellect, you know, get you so wound up that it doesn't know which ends up. You'll get through it. It'll, it will get clearer. Now, whether that takes a month or a year or just a few hours, I don't know. That'll be up to you as to how quickly you kind of coalesce to an understanding of who you are and why you are and how do you want to be. You know, what do you want in life? What's important to you? You know, what's really important? So people who, when they ask, what's really important to me? If they are more self-centered, they will answer that by, by making a list of how they want things to be. But better to make a list of how not how you want things to be, but how you want to be. Mm. See, if the, most, if the most important thing in your life is not feeling pain or not being hurt, then that's not so good because then you won't reach out. You won't make connections. You won't, uh, you won't try. You'll get into the old strategy of, well, I can't lose if I don't play, and you'll stop playing. We'll try to get out of the game altogether. And that's always a losing strategy. If you don't play, you can't win. So you have to realize that sometimes hurt and pain are part of the process and accept that. They have something to teach you. There's something going on there that you're not at ease with yet, and you need to give it time. Give it time. Just try to be positive. Try, try to not process the, this is not what I want. Just feel and be and stay as positive as possible and you'll get through it. Yeah, but so how do I make um, decisions then? Because I do realize that like most of my decisions that I've been making in the past years or they have been very self-centered and very focused in what I want to get from life and mm -hmm. um, so and I, and I still have to, so now I'm in this conflict where I still have those wants and needs and I feel like I'm going to get happiness in uh, another place I move to or another holiday I go to or another person that I'm going to meet or another job mm -hmm. that I'm going to have or more money that I'm going to earn. It's like, I'm still like, there's still a part of me that is like very interested in that. And then there's this other part that is, that is kind of aware of that. That's not what is going to like lead to any happiness or what's going to mm -hmm. make you feel better. So it's just, so, yeah, so that's what I'm saying. Like, I feel like an inner conflict because I feel like I'm very, like there's this one side pushing me in one direction and the other one in that direction. So how is it good that I still sort of approach those things that um, I think that's going to make me happy just to prove myself another time more that it won't? Or is it good to just... <laughs> Just uh, really just work on my fears, work on my fears and just um, until they just naturally fall away. I think the latter is probably better because the, th the former for you is what you've been doing for most of your adult life is, well, the next relationship, the next vacation, the next, like you say, you know, that might turn out really well, but nothing's <laughs> turned out really well yet. But you get all excited about it. Oh, okay, I've gone to this new place and met these new people, and now everything's going to be great. And then it turns out to be kind of same old, same old stuff that you've been running away from your whole life. And then you run to the next place, which turns out after a while to be the same as the 
same stuff you've been running away from all your life and so on. And that's going to continue to go. And the result of that is going to be that you'll get more and more frustrated. You'll get more anxious and you will eventually get to be jaded to where you think there is no happiness. There is no satisfaction. There are no good relationships and you will stop playing the game. You'll stop trying. You'll go someplace and be basically unhappy. So that doesn't have a good ending. You know, chasing after the next thing that's going to make you happy generally ends in you being unhappy and you get to the point that you stop trying. You don't even go to the next place. You're just going to stay here and unhappy because it doesn't matter anyway, because there isn't anything out there that's going to be good. And you get in that kind of place and then you become a very self-centered, unhappy person. And many people, that's how they live their life. You know, there's a whole lot of people out there that live in that mode and they've been in that mode for the last 30, 40 years. And that's sad. That's a place you don't want to go. It would be much better to say, well, what really is important? You know, what am I really looking for? And if you come to the conclusions, what am I really looking for? Then you're going to have to say, well, why haven't I found that yet? Because what you're really looking for has probably been available mostly wherever you've been. Whatever, wherever you've gone, whatever people you've met, it's probably been there. You just couldn't see it because you were too self-centered to see it. It was, it was looking for what made you feel good. And what makes you feel good is usually coming from that intellect. Oh, if I just had this, I'd feel good. If I just had more money, I'd feel better. If I just lived in a prettier place, I'd feel better. And you have to think about, well, what could I change? What could I do differently? Instead of trying to change the outside world until you feel better, think about changing the inside world until you feel better. <laughs> what can I do? How could I be different? You know, what is it that I keep running into? Oh, my expectations aren't met. Uh, that's the problem. I just have to keep searching until I find somebody that meets my expectations. Ah, okay, well, let's go find somebody else. Maybe they'll meet my expectations. Well, consider the possibility that your problem is your expectations or even having expectations. Rather than living to get to a certain endpoint, let the goal, let the endpoint take care of itself. Live just by being you, by being authentic and connecting with people and sharing and caring and learning. And sometimes that's painful. So you have to accept that. Sometimes there's going to be problems that you're going to have to work out. You accept that. It's part of life. But if you keep chasing after that perfect situation that's going to make you happy, you probably won't find it until the point that you give up. And better to realize that happiness is something that you create because of who you are, what you are. You know, matter of fact, you know, it only it only takes one person who loves unconditionally to make a relationship work. So whether your relationships work or not can be up to you. Now, most people don't just love unconditionally like that. They're not that grown up that they can do that. But you can move toward that idea, find happiness, find satisfaction and positiveness wherever you go. Just look for the good things. Say, what's good about this? Ah, that's good. Well, there's these other parts that I don't like because I'd rather be someplace else, but what's more important? Me getting just what I want the way I want it or really enjoying the good things that I've got. 
feel thankful for the things you have and don't worry so much about the things you don't have. And eventually those, those wants that you don't have will tend to grow smaller and smaller until they disappear because they really weren't all that important anyway. You just thought they were. So that's what I would suggest. Now, just, I'm not just talking to Caroline here, you know, what I've just said kind of applies to almost everybody, you know, no matter what your life's like, no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, you know. So it's, uh, this is just the general way and attitude that you should have toward life. Look at the positive parts and focus on those. The negative stuff, eh, you know, let it go. Just, it's not that important. So for the most case, I think that's good advice for you. Now, you know, the negative stuff gets negative enough, then you do have to look at it and stand up. Like if somebody's beating you or, uh, you know, hitting you with a, you know, with a, with a rubber hose or, you know, doing things like that, then you need to say, well, no, I reject that. And I'm going away. So it's not that you ignore the negative always. You have to know, you know, whether where you are has potential. If you get to the point that where you are has no potential, then it's time to go someplace else. But as long as it has significant potential, then usually you can find the positiveness and be happy with the positiveness and don't be unhappy with what seems to be negative. And the magic is that when you stop focusing on the negative, most of the negative stuff goes away and isn't all that negative anymore. It's just the way it is. It's not that big a deal. As long as you're focused on it, it drives you crazy. I can't stand that, you know, and it drives you crazy. But when you just let it be and say, oh, it just is what it is, it's not all that important, then it stops driving you crazy and becomes irrelevant. And how do I evaluate whether something has potential or not? You have to feel that. You just have to feel it. You have to look at it and say, is there potential here? Could this, could this grow? Could this, could this be something that's worth, you know, investing in? Is there, is, is this going to be a good investment? Because you invest your time, you invest your presence, you invest your, your being. You only have so much time here. And is this going to, can this lead to a good place? Well, if it can, then the next question is, how do I, how do I change me to raise those odds that it will go to a good place? But if you look at something and you, and you just don't see any potential in it, like, It's throwing good money after bad. Now, no matter what I do or how I am or whatever, it's just never going to end in a good place. It has no potential to be good. Then it's probably time to find something else. But mostly uh, you can find positive potential in almost everything and everyone. And then it's a matter of making an investment. And, you know, if you... You make investments, then things grow. They're good investments, they go. They're bad investments, maybe that potential will decrease. You can always reevaluate later. So see where it goes. Work it till, till you've tried every angle and there is no potential left, and then it's time to go. But as long as there's potential, you can see how this might be a good thing. Good for you and good for everyone. Then work on it. Be it. You can learn from almost everything. This idea that if we could just have a different environment, if we just had more money in the bank, if we just had, you know, this or that, that life would be perfect. Usually that doesn't work out because the problem isn't with our environment. The problem is inside of us. We're self-centered. We need things to be a certain way. And that's the problem. Because the way we need those things to be is generally not all that important. We've just made it very important. It's important because of our own fears. 
And if we get rid of those fears, then it's not important anymore. So instead of searching the world over, you know, for happiness, try to find happiness right where you are. That would be the first step. And until you've uncovered every rock there and, and inspected it and focused on it and learned it and gotten to the point that you think there's no more potential, then it's time to move on. But otherwise, probably not so. Value usually comes from long-term investment. Whether you're investing money or investing your life, you know, there's, there's, uh, usually it's a, it's a long-term viewpoint does better in the long run than that, uh, you know, if you take all your money out every other day and then buy new things and then take your money out a day after that and buy new things, if you're constantly looking for the best thing to invest in, you'll end up not making much money. You have to pick good things that have potential and then let it ride. You, you can't just be jumping from one thing to another. Life's like that as well. Thank you very much, Tom. That's very helpful. Good. Thanks, Carolyn. That's that's a question that's going to help a, a lot of people. Um, we next have John McKay. Um, his question, it kind of follows up to what Carolyn's question was. I've heard you give all kinds of advice, Tom, on dealing with people and their issues. You say things like accept the way they are and give them an environment in which they'll feel safe, or you can just give them some love. Now, people who just watch your videos may not be aware of this, but at the beginning of the chat, you send everyone some love. And I was wondering how you do that so effectively. How how have you developed that? Do you visualize something in the beginning like a ray of light? Is it the same way when you're healing with your mind? Do you change yourself up in point consciousness and send that energy to people? Can you talk about this aspect of love? Can anyone do this? with their intent, and how does one develop it? <laughs> well, you know, I'm not even too aware that I'm doing that, but I can imagine now that I think about it from listening to the comment that, yeah, I do, but it's not because I actually make an effort to do that. I think what, what you're getting is that, is that I, I really care about people. And when we have these Zooms and up comes a bunch of people and I see pictures and sometimes I don't see pictures. I even see just, just names that are down there because they're, they're not, uh, have, they don't have the video on. I care about everybody who's there. Everybody there is an important person to me. And I'm hoping that I will be able to find some, something that will help them, that will help them grow, that help them find themselves, be happy or be more positive. So when I look at people, it's not just that a bunch of people. They're all special. They all mean something to me, and I care about them all. And I think that's what you're feeling. I don't go around and send something to everybody on purpose anyway, but I suspect I do send something to everybody without intending to do so just because that's the way I am. That's the way I see other people. I see other people as you know, beautiful people who are struggling and trying very hard to deal with the things they have in their life and uh, have a lot of compassion for them, for the struggle, for the pain they're going through, for their difficulties. And I, uh, that, that sense of, positiveness I feel toward them is probably what you're thinking of. It's, but it's not really targeted at each individual. It just happens. And Tom, could you answer the part of that that um, asks, can anyone do this? Can anyone develop these abilities? Sure. Not only can everyone do this, but everyone who successfully gets rid of a lot of fear will do that. <laughs> like me, whether they want to or not, you know, it won't be something they really have to do. It'll just be a way they are. 
And you probably know people like that. You know, you probably know somebody who is just a very giving person. And when you're around them, you just feel very positive. You know, it's just someone that uh, always has something pleasant to say. He hardly ever complains. And it's just positive. And they're doing the same thing. You know, be, they've gotten rid of enough of their own fear and their own ego and beliefs that uh, they just kind of radiate positiveness. And everybody likes people like that. They're more fun to be around. You feel like you could tell them anything, you know, they're, they're non-judgmental. I'm sure you all can go into your mind and come up with a, a person or two who's like that. So yes, anybody can be that way. All right, Tommy, it goes on to ask, um, I'd like to better understand what some people call guides and others might call angels. The first line of the popular song, Angels, is sit and wait. Does an angel contemplate my fate? And I find myself wondering that a lot. There are many instances, for example, in the Explorer tapes and in Seth Speaks, when an individual has an entity of a higher quality of consciousness talk through them. And they usually say something like, I've been working with this person for some time now, and even over many lifetimes. I've often heard you say, Tom, that this is just a personal interface with the LCS. That's the larger consciousness system. But I wonder if I could delve a bit deeper and help people understand this. Is it a higher level IUOC providing nudges to many free will awareness units? Do we all grow to become guides of some sort at some stage? What's going on? <laughs> well, that simple uh, assertion that it's and your own personal interface with the larger consciousness system, that really is the, the best explanation of it. It's not other IUOCs, although there are some other IUOCs out there that may be very caring about you. you know, there may be other IUOCs, probably family, you know, maybe a parent, you know, maybe a brother or sister, or maybe a a, a friend who is a very deep friend, but someone you have a uh, someone that you mean a lot to, and that person will always have positive energy heading your direction that you will feel. But the the guide, the person that you talk to, that you interact with, that uh, helps you solve your problems, helps you have a better perspective. The best way to think of that is it's just the larger consciousness system trying to help you out. As you evolve, it evolves. It has, you know, it has incentive for you to succeed, for you to grow. And therefore, if it thinks it can help, if it thinks it can, by some mechanism, if it thinks it can connect with you and help you grow, help you see from a better, more profound perspective, then it will do that. It's just, it's just available. Now, when we think about that, we say, well, you know, we're just a piece of that larger consciousness system and we have thoughts and intentions and we can focus on other people. We can make people feel more comfortable or less, depending on whether we're pushing positive or negative feelings. Yes, we can. And so can the system in the same way we can. We're both consciousness. But the system's more aware than we are of these other people. We may be aware of a few certain people, and we're aware when they're not feeling well, and we're aware when they need a little extra something from us. But the system's a lot more aware of us than we generally are of others. We tend to be more self-focused and self-centered than the system. It's more aware and more connected. So when there is some opportunity to nudge you, it will pick the best way to do that. And often that's through the some connection through an interface. An interface is what you call an entity. You know, 
you might even think of yourself as an interface, you know, to the larger consciousness system. But this entity that you talk to, like Seth, is there to help you grow and other people grow. If the if it looks like in the future you're going to write a book about you and your entity and the conversations, then the entity will not only tell things that are good for you, but it will tell things that are good for you to tell other people. Okay, so that gives the larger conscious system a, a what a lectern, a, a pulpit, a, a place in which to speak to people through others' avatars to consciousness through their avatars. People write books, people discuss their connections. So it's the system trying to help us out. It could be somebody specific, some other IUOC. It could be your mother who's worried about you and is sending you positive energy. But for the most part, just saying it's a, it's a, you know, it's your personal interface with the LCS and that can change. If, if right now, you know, you know, this kind of material or this kind of nudge is going to work for you, then that's what you'll get. If later it's different, then you'll get something different. And yes, often the system's been working with you for a long time and been trying to nudge you and trying to help you out. Anybody who's ready, anybody who's trying to grow, anybody who's serious about growing up, the system will be there doing what it can do to help you do that. And if it finds a, another face to do that as, like as, you know, Seth or any of the other, those, of those who are being channeled, then it will do that too. So there's no need to personalize it into some special angel entity that is working with you because you're ready to be worked with. We could do that, but then we come up with another whole set of beings that we now have to place in our mind in the, in, in the nature of reality. Okay, now there's all these angels. There's all these guides, and you know what? What do they do all day when they're waiting for me to pay attention to them? Because I only pay attention to them for maybe 15, 20 minutes, you know, in a day. So what do they do all the rest of the time? I'm a, you know, what about the channel? What does Seth do all the time? Jane's busy doing other things. You know, Jane is. Uh, I don't know if you guys know Seth and Jane, but Seth was the, the, the. The spirit being and Jane was the was the avatar that was that was uh, getting that communication, the channel. So in any case, so what Seth do all day while Jane's you know cooking dinner and uh, driving her car and doing other things? She's busy. Well, he's not just hanging out waiting for Jane to have a session so he can tell more things. So Seth is always there and not there. It's just a part of the system. It's not really other entities floating around. I mean, you could make that. I'm not saying that's impossible. I'm just saying that is a cluttered model. It has a lot of things in it that, you know, what do angels do all day? What, uh, you know, what's, what's their day like? Or are they just attached to you? Or are they a part of yourself? Or maybe it's your higher self. And we can make all kinds of things up. But... They all really functionally are one thing, and that it's the larger consciousness system having an interface with you. After all, that's what we are. We're just a piece of this larger conscious system. We're a piece of that system. We're a, a subset of it. And some other subset of it, if you will, is talking to us. Seth is also a subset of it. Well, all those subsets that are uh, you know, part of the system, let's just let them be part of the system, and we can interact with them as that. It's just simpler that way. So that's why I have that, that very simple answer for it, because I think simple's better. Complication uh, 
has a lot of conjecture in it and people start to, to wrap their beliefs up around their conjecture and then it gets to be more important than it is. All right, thank you, Tom. Chidi, please go ahead with your questions. Yeah, um, I would like actually to start with connecting to Caroline here because um, actually I, I had a similar experience like that a while ago. Um, <clears throat> and, and I think it's when we start uh, realizing or recognizing the voice of the ego and you don't want to listen to it anymore because you you realize that you had a fake sort of fake identity based on ego and then you want to have you want to find yourself who am i and in in that process i think for me at least that there was a lot of insecurity because i didn't know who i was all of a sudden <laughs> and i felt so insecure it was like all security that the ego gave me was gone. And I was there with not feeling good enough at all and feeling very insecure. And uh, then I started to uh, to ask, who am I? Who am I? Who am I really <laughs> without ego? Or who would I be then? So in that question, I think uh, you can find answers and you can start to grow a little bit. Um, but it, it takes time to find mm -hmm. who you are if you <laughs> when you're in this process because it's very confusing and mm -hmm. uh, a lot of thoughts <laughs> and feelings. Yeah. Yeah. So I just and, wanted to mention that. <laughs> yeah, and it's not just you and Caroline. This no. <laughs> this conversation applies to probably you know eighty ninety percent of the people walking the planet. You know this is. This is life. This is growing up. This is what we're here for. This is what we do. And it's a struggle that everybody is experiencing. People are just in different parts of it and different phases of it. That's one of the reasons I took so long with Caroline, you know, to explain it, because it's mm. really something that most everybody's going through. And yes, you have to say, who am I? And what is it that I'm really looking for? You know, what is it that's really important to me? And the ego will tell you all kinds of things that are important to, to you. Oh, it's important that people see you as competent. It's important that you know, people see you this way and that way and all that's image stuff. And that's not important, really. But eventually you'll find out what is really important. And you know, it almost always turns back to relationship. It turns back to relationship. And relationship almost always eventually turns back to giving. What can I, what can I give? Uh, and that's, that's usually when you get the right answer. As long as it's, what do I need? You usually are in not getting the right answer. When you get to the point that it's not about your needs anymore, that it's, what can I give? then you you're probably pretty much there how can i help and how can i just let people be that's a hard one how can i just let people be the way they are you know and not just be stressed out because they're not the way they should be that's not the things they should have said that's you know they need to think differently they need to be differently and we get so wound up over the way we need other people to be, the way they should be, the way that would be best for them to be, the way we want them to be, that we fail to just let them be who they are and love them just like that, rather than try to fix them and help them be more, help them grow up. We all are such helpers for other people's growth that we tend to neglect, you know, we tend to neglect our own because we're so focused on helping other people see things the right way that, uh, that, that gets in the way of ourselves being able to see things the right way. Yeah. It's just, it's a, it's what most everybody here is doing. 
exactly what uh, Caroline and Titi are talking about. That's that's life here, in a you know, in a human avatar. That's the whole thing in a nutshell. Is what we're trying to do. Yeah, but let's see. <laughs> um, we have covered a great area of uh, things uh, lately, Tom. And uh, I have still a lot of homework to do. <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm, I'm I must say uh, that um, uh, I I think it's very good when when you when you talk about things, uh, Tom. And I normally afterwards I record it on my phone, so I have specific audio segments from Tom that resonates with fear work, and then I can listen to them over and over again and. There are new insights to discover every time. And I found this very powerful and handy because you sort of, every time you listen, a little bit of uh, belief layer will come off and you will understand more. So, so that's a very good thing of going about it. Um, <clears throat> but we also talked about tracing um, the roots of a fear and understanding what that root is and uh, last time I got a very important insight um, that it is my that my childhood could have been something totally different if I if I had come in with higher quality of consciousness and therefore inter interpreted it differently so I have now understood that it was all about my interpretation of the experiences I had based mm -hmm. on my low quality of consciousness. So it was not about what happened to me. And, and this was a very, very helpful insight, I think. Mm -hmm. And then we have also talked about what you recently said here about letting pe other people be who they are. <laughs> <laughs> That's so tricky, I think, especially when you're a parent. I find that so difficult. Um, so I have a question that relates to that a little bit today. Uh, you see, I, I really want to encourage and support my youngsters in their inner growth. But um at the moment it's rather tricky to connect and talk about these things with them so i use other tools i try to encourage them in consciousness and uh, i also use outpouring but at the same time i'm working on moving away from unhealthy dependencies and manip manipulation so with this in mind what is there to think about when i use these tools in tools in this purpose are there any risks to consider or should i even totally let them be uh, stop fixing and helping <laughs> without pouring and uh, in consciousness yeah. um yeah what do you think about this okay well yes you can you can actively help without being too active what you have to do is start a conversation or bring up a subject or point something out that triggers them to think about that subject and maybe ask some questions. You can talk to your children about things. You can bring up, let's say, situations. You know, what? here's the situation. What would be the right thing to do? You see, now, if you talk to your children with the idea that here I'm telling you what the right thing is to do, you know, here's a situation and here's the right thing to do, that's not helpful. What you have to do is say, here's a situation. And there are different ways that one could react to that situation. And maybe go through those ways and, and some of the upsides and downsides, but make sure you have some upside and downside for every one of them. Even the ones that are poor choices, there's a, some upside to it. It might just be ego or something, but there's some upside. And then let them think about it. See, now you, you put a seed out there to think about these kinds of situations. 
So if you think there's an area where they need to consider things and grow, then come up with a with some kind of a, a situation or a connection, some way, something is going on in the world, something happening in their family, something is happening with their friends, you know, something they can relate to and and then point out what that situation is, but don't give them the answer. Let them just think about it. And if they have a question, and if you're non-judgmental, they'll ask you, and then you can dig just a little deeper. You can give them a little more. And that's the way I think you can deal with your children, is to create a, a, a It kind of it has to be organic. If you just make something up out of the blue, they'll think, "Oh, mom's testing me." Now, what's the right answer? What's the answer that mom wants? Uh, I bet she wants me to say this. Okay, then they'll say that to you, you know, because kids think in terms of getting the right answer when they're being questioned by adults or teachers or whatever. You know, in their mind, it's not to learn anything. In their mind, it's to get the right answer. And get this person off my back, you know, or, or make the, you know, get them to go call on somebody else. So, find up something that's organic to their life, some way that that is meaningful. A meaningful choice is made, and just talk about the choice, but not necessarily tell them, you know, here are good choices, here are bad choices. Let them make that up on their own. So you'll have to be creative to figure out just how to do that. But if you think about it a, wh- a, way, uh, a, a while and then practice it, you'll get better and better at it to where these little learning points, these little learning moments, these little learning things will just come to you and you'll bring them up. And even if your kids act like they're not listening, they will be listening anyway. And they act like they they're not going to think about it. They're done with it. They're tired about it. They're bored with it. They'll think about it anyway. They just don't want you to know that they're thinking about it because kids have to be independent. You know, they have to not uh, do what their parents tell them. That's, that's not what they do. So, so even if they're humming or their eyes are, you know, rolling or something, you can still have a conversation with them and they'll get it. They're taking it in. They're seeing what you're doing. And if you're not trying to scold them or tell them what to do or tell them what's wrong, then they'll listen. If you're just having a, you know, if you're just opening up possibilities for them, they'll begin to like it and they'll begin to hang out with you more because they enjoy these sessions. They learn from them. And then it'll just get easier. That's what I would do. Try to involve them in real life stuff, stuff that's going on in their life, choices they have. But don't talk about their choice. Talk about choices in general like that and kind of work it around to where they see themselves in the story, but not directly. Because you can't, as a parent, just say, you know, This is what you need to do in life. You know, you need to be like this and you need to be like this and you need not to do these things because kids past a certain age just reject that because they can't just be the parent's puppet. They have to be themselves. So they out of hand reject those sorts of things. Not only that, in order to save their own self-esteem, they may have to do the opposite of what you tell them. They may be pushed. You may push them to do the opposite of what you want them to do just by telling them to do what you want them to do or to not do what you don't want them to do. That's, you have to not, you know, what, I don't know how, what that age is, but you'll know that with your own children. You know, there's age where they have to push back, where they have to be independent. They have to come to their own conclusions because they have to feel like they are somebody. They're not just a, you know, a, a, puppet that their mom has her hand up their back and makes them talk. They have to be an independent whole person making their own choices. So you have to let them be that. 
and give them guidance by talking about not necessarily that particular choice, but similar kinds of choices that happen somewhere in the news, or maybe they're talking to you about it, and just be helpful rather than give them answers. That's what I would say to do with with children as old as yours. Now, with mm. four and five year olds, it's a different approach. You know, you can't do that as much. But with children that are old enough to want to be independent, well, a two year old wants to be independent. But when they actually are old enough to be, you know, to, to be developing their own independence, then you'll have to let them have that and give them. Things to think about, guidance. But you have to give it in a way that they don't think you're trying to manipulate them. So you have to really, you know, I I had to struggle with that some with my girls. I'd talk with them, and I'd have to be sure that if there were five different possibilities here, that I made sure I found something good to say about all five of them and something not so good to say about all five of them, so that I didn't give them any hint that I was I was trying to lead them to a particular choice, because then they would have turned me off. So you have to make sure that they're not aware that you're leading them to any choice. And in fact, the best way to do that is not try to lead them to a particular choice, but just make sure that they go into life well armed with an understanding of the possibilities and the things that could happen. And it's their choice. That's called guidance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which kids need a lot of guidance. But uh, Tom, what, what do you think? Because I, I was thinking a little bit about if you can't talk to them. <laughs> But sometimes it's just, you know, closed. Yeah. <laughs> and well. so, so what I do then is that I, in consciousness, without speaking in, in the physical, I, mm-hmm. I, I enc- try to encourage them in consciousness instead. Uh, and then I do outpouring and visualizes yeah. like oh. um, mm-hmm. their, a good future and courage and all of these things. Uh, it, but I, I do that quite a lot. But uh, so now I'm just thinking: is that manipulative? And no, that's, could that's that good. Be... It is manipulative if you're trying to to get to think and act a certain way. Then that's manipulative. Mm-hmm. But if you're just giving them energy and love and caring and and helping them see possibilities and other ways of being, you know, and you're not trying to put a solution into their mind, then it's not manipulative and it's very good. Mm-hmm. But in order to get that conversation started so that you don't get shut out, find something that they're interested in. They're interested in, say, playing video games. Well, ask them about their video games. Ask them if they mind if you watch them play it for a bit so you see what's going on. And ask them questions about that. And try to be try to find something they're interested in. In other words, see if you can't find their their reality, their viewpoint of life. See reality from from their eyes. How do they see things? And communicate with them at that level what they're interested in. And in the beginning, they're probably going to want to brush you off because they figure that you're it's a trick. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some sort of trick. Mom's going to try to manipulate me somehow. I don't know what it is, but it's probably a trick. So it may only is, you know, five minutes and then make it a little longer and be genuinely interested in their life and what they're doing. Not because you're going to give them advice and tell them what to do, but just because you're interested in that. Share an interest with them. You see? It's not like, oh, mom wants to look at my video games and then she's going to complain about it or she's going to tell me, you know, that I shouldn't spend all my time doing it. And, you know, if they feel some kind of manipulation coming, then they're going to want to, you know, brush you off. But if you just watch it for a while and say, gee, well, that was kind of interesting. And, you know, why does that character always do that? And just kind of be there with them and then let that go. No lesson, nothing you're trying to do. You're just interacting with them. After you do that a few dozen times, they'll begin to 
stop being so worried that you're, you know, that you've got some kind of plan coming for them, something you're trying to get them to do or not do. So try that for a while. Mm. Yeah, you have to earn their trust. Mm. You know, if 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 during their life they get the idea that parents are trying to tell me how to be and what to do and the best way I need to be, then they're not going to open up and just be, you know, just not going to share with you because they don't want that. Even if they need it, even if they desperately need it, they don't want it. So if you first, you're going to have to earn that trust that you are just kind of being friends with them. You're just talking about the things they're interested in just because you're interested so you'll have to get interested in maybe some of the things they're interested in. And they won't trust it for a while. They'll think you're just, you've got some, some cut, something, you know, some ulterior motivation here. But eventually, with some time, you know, you'll break through that lack of trust. And pretty soon they'll be interacting with you and, and uh, they'll be, able to come ask you for advice because they know that you're not going to judge them and tell them what they should have done. Oh, you didn't do that right. You should have done this. Well, they don't want to hear that. They, but when you don't tell them things like that, then they will come and ask you advice and you give them some advice and they'll, they won't necessarily do it or not do it, but they'll think about it, which is, as much as you can hope for. Parenting is a tricky business because you got to get your ego out of the way so that your ego does not conflict with their egos. Tom Campbell here. I and MBT Events hope you liked this video. We now have well over a thousand hours of free video on this user-friendly ad-free YouTube channel. Though these videos are free to our viewers, they represent many thousands of hours in production and editing, and many thousands of dollars invested in video and audio equipment, along with the required computers and software to store and process the raw video into finished products. So far, all of this content has been funded directly out of our own pockets. Be assured, we will always continue to do what we can it's our life, our purpose, a labor of love that we will continue to pursue as best we can. However, those pockets are not as deep as they used to be. Thus, we are now seeking to augment our resources with support from our viewers. If you find something of significant value in our videos, please consider supporting their production through our Patreon account or through a one-time donation. The links are in the description below. Thank you.